So I'm very pleased to pass over to Daniel Misalidis from La Trobe and Amber J. Jacqui um, from Victoria University who are going to do the day one report between them. So hello everyone, it's not only my absolute pleasure but my genuine privilege to address you all today with what we've spoken about in the last couple of days. Um, I think it's really valuable that we have this kind of connection to the real stakeholders here which is the MECFS community at large and the people on the ground trying to find the answers for you. Oh, there's a clicker somewhere, I presume. Green forward. Yep, it's working. So, um, so I'm just going to take you through the first two sessions that were covered on day one. The first one is mitochondrial function and signalling. So the first talk that was given was given by my supervisor on work that I had undertaken. By coincidence, it's also the first one that I'm going through today. Um, so as Bruce already mentioned to you, uh, the mitochondria have this machinery that generates our energy currency called the electron transport chain. And it's a really, really, as Bruce said, interesting and glorious thing. But in MECFS, we think that there's a problem. So in the work that I've undertaken, it seems that there's some manner of inefficiency. It may be and is likely to be in complex five. Complex five is the part of the machinery that directly generates ATP, which is the energy currency of our cells. So this inefficient energy generation is accompanied by an elevation of supporting um, catabolic pathways and respiratory complexes. Um, this could be a compensatory effect, but we don't know which is the cause and which is the effect as of yet, so we're pursuing these angles. But it's very clear that in the cell type that we're looking at from MECFS patient blood, um, there's some manner of mitochondrial inefficiency that's accompanied by a stress sensing elevation, which is in response to an energy stress. So there's been some other work done in the UK by Cara Thomas. Uh, she's found that mitochondrial respiration was reduced in MECFS PBMCs, which are cells taken straight out of the blood of MECFS patients. And the difference in the patterns that Cara sees from what we've reported are likely due to a difference in cell type. Uh, the cells that we use actively metabolise and are happy in a culture environment. These cells are challenged by an environment outside of the body, so it's kind of two different suites of information. So they are compatible with each other and give us parts of a broader picture. Um, so this figure here is a typical readout of the technique that both of us use and Cara focused on for her work. It's called seahorse respirometry. And the thing I want you to take away is that this y-axis here is the oxygen consumption by respiration. It tells you how much respiration is taking place. The top line are the controls and the bottom of the CFS. So the CFS have reduced respiration. And CAR has also found in subsequent follow-up work that the respiratory complexes are functionally normal. So it's not necessarily a, a defect in, let's say, complexes one to four. It's some manner of uh, effect on the cells, perhaps by the environment or some more global defect. So the second session was on immunology, which I'll move to now. So the group in Queensland, uh, in Queensland at Griffith University specialise in looking at natural killer cells, which are one of the most commonly affected immune types in MECFS, and at looking at calcium signalling in these cells. And over the course of many studies and many years, they've pursued um, looking at calcium signalling in these NK cells and how that may be dysregulated. And what they've come up with 
is that a family of calcium transport channels called the TR, the TRIPM family channels, have had genetic changes detected and reduced expression, responsiveness and function of these channels which move calcium into and out of the cells, which is key for their proper effective function in the immune system. Uh, reduced parameters of these channels are associated with diminished calcium flux, which is represented by some data which they've reported. This is the response of these calcium ion channels to stimulus in healthy controls, and this is in individuals with ME-CFS. As you can see, it's a flat line. There's no response. So this seems to be some kind of pathological calcium signaling dysregulation in this important immune cell type. So Travis Craddock and his team uh, are looking at ways of using computational modelling to assess the alternative resting states that chronic conditions may be perpetuated by. So if we look at MECFS as an alternative state uh, nudged by some kind of insult, let's say a chemical exposure or an initial infection or high stress, if that uh, resting uh, steady state of, let's say, metabolism, immune regulation, homeostatic regulation in general. If that state is nudged into an alternative rut, which it can't spill back into normal function, you get the perpetuation of a chronic disease state. And so what Travis's team does is they model pathways that may be affected or that are of interest, which is over here, just some, exa some examples. Um, you don't need to know what the specifics are, but it's just a visual representation of how they do things. They define limits on pathways of interest and then use computational modelling to interrogate which alternative homeostatic resting states may be possible within that defined pathway network. And then we can look at or well, they can look at from these alternative uh, steady states which parts of the pathway may be targets for therapeutic interventions and then can use that as a screen to look for future uh, therapeutic um, options targeted at candidates in these pathways. And they've identified several targets relevant to CFS that they are pursuing. So um, the group up in London, uh, work undertaken by Fain, Dr. Fain Mensah and supervised by Joe Cambridge, who presented this work, um, is looking at both immune cell function and metabolism and looking at the relationship between these two things. So CD24 is a cell surface marker which is involved early in immune B cell development. And these markers are elevated as a percentage in MECFS patients, which suggests that these early uh, immune B cells uh, more make up a larger percentage of the B cell population in MECFS. But what's very interesting is that the CD24 presentation and the prevalence of these cells are associated with an unresponsiveness to immune stimulation, elevated cell death and changes to metabolism in this cell type, which may have some relevance with the previous reports of um, mitochondrial dysregulation as well. And specifically, um, as done by metabolomics work undertaken by Dr Chris Armstrong, uh, glycolysis seems to trend downwards with presentation of these early stage uh, cell surface markers which suggests that as the cells mature glycolysis is uh, less preferentially relied on. So that brings us to the end of the first half of day one and I'll pass it on to Amber to recap the second half for you. Hi everyone. Um, before I start with the summaries of session three and four, I would really like to thank Daniel um, for A, calming my nerves, <laughs> um, and B, also putting these um, slides together. So we had about 
more 24 hour turnaround to put all of this together and putting all the sessions together in 20 minutes. Um, yeah, it's more difficult than you think. <laughs> um, so the first session was on neuroimaging, which um, focused on two presentations about the brain and um, MRI results or magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so the first one was um, brainstem myelination and MRI eye changes in CFS ME. And this was presented by Dr. Leighton Barnden from Griffith University in Queensland. Um, so in ME CFS, the brainstem is not functioning and connecting with the rest of the body as it should. Um, correlation of clinical measures with the MRI results revealed abnormalities in MECFS patients compared to healthy controls, um, revealed abnormalities, um, and it focused on the myelin, um, which is a part of the nerve structure which acts like a highway for signal transmission for the nervous system. So basically, in the nutshell of their study, um, it found that in MECFS, the impairment of myelina myelination and nerve conduction within the brainstem can be seen as a compensatory response from the breakdown in the communication and contributing to the presence of symptoms. Um, so the second presentation in this session was from Dr. Alicia Joseph at um, the Murdoch's Children's Research Institute and the Royal Children's Hospital, Melbourne. Um, and their research was about mapping fatigue in the brain in paediatric chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so dealing with paediatric MECFS. Um, their study focused on children and adolescents at the time of diagnosis and again at a two year follow up. Um, they used MRI studies and questionnaires before and after a period of cognitive exertion. Um, their results showed that there was effective, affected cognitive performance and higher fatigue in this pediatric MECFS group compared to the healthy controls. Um, and it's great, um, great research, but it's also a highlight of the research specific to MECFS, um, as it is important because it has implications for the young patients, um, as well as anyone who is involved in their care and management. And the last session of day one was um, about biobanking and clinical data, um, and there were two presentations in this session, um, so the first was infrastructure and translational research in MECFS, the experience of Cure ME and the UK MECFS Biobank. And this was presented by Dr. Louis Nicoul, got it right, <laughs> um, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, in the UK. So he addressed the need for a biobank, um, which a biobank is a repository of biological samples and associated data. Um, I like to think of it as like a huge library of everything put together in a nice safe spot. Um, and this rich resource allows for opportunity for international collaboration and efficiency with conducting quality research. Um, and at the end of the day, it all supports the translation of research discoveries to clinical application and practice. So that journey from, you know, the benches at the, in the laboratories to the bedside of the patient. Um, and the last presentation of the day was from Associate Professor Brett Lidbury at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, and their study was about rethinking diagnostic reference intervals for MECFS via machine learning and the utility of active and B to assess symptom severity. Um, so machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence used to make sense of all the data. And I can tell you there are no aliens <laughs> involved in this. <laughs> and Brett can <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, and it can, or this technique or tool can be used to analyze a range of pathology test results of MECFS patients. 
Um, and by using le ma machine learning, um, their study has identified serum active in B concentrations as significantly different between MECFS patients and healthy controls. Um, and from this study, uh, like apart from the findings, but it's also that this approach can provide effective screening tools for clinicians when they interpret test results. Um, and that was the last presentation of day one. Um, and it was a fantastic day overall, and I think we can all agree that all the presentations have been fantastic. <laughs> um, and definitely the research space is heading in the right direction for ME-CFS. So thank you, and it's now up to Brett to summarise day two. <laughs>